Thanks, band. We'll see you in just a moment. Um, have we got any indecisive people in the room? <laughs> and everyone's like, mm, I don't really know. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't know about you, but the older I've got, I find, it, I find myself being more indecisive. It's harder to make a choice. You know, like when I was younger, if you wanted to watch a film, then you've pretty much got four or maybe five channels to choose from, and then you've got like your shelf of videos or DVDs. You know, anyone, anyone, videos? Come on. You know, videos that maybe a parent has recorded. Some of these videos that when I was a kid were older than me. Films that were recorded from even before I was born, and you're like, I don't know what that is, as you know, scroll through, and there's literally a few kind of options, and it's a bit easier to make a decision. But now we've got Netflix. Praise Jesus for, for you know for Netflix. But the decision, like I find myself spending more time trying to choose a film than actually watching a film. Anyone feel my pain? Yeah, and we go through, and they literally have category after category after category, not just film after film. They have like a bajillion films, but they have category after category. Here is some of the categories that you can find. There on Netflix is trending now, has a whole heap of films, award-winning films, European films and programs, family watch together films, movies from the 90s. Come on, for a few of us. Uh, talking animal animation. Skip that category. New release, Jumpstart Your Day uh, TV for kids. Also, jump that one if you can. Uh, but there's a whole heap of categories that makes it really difficult to make a decision. Uh, or maybe music. Maybe you're in the car, you're like me, and you're people in the car, and you're like, oh, let's put some music on. I don't really like to do things without music, other than when I sleep. Uh, and I'm like, let's put, um, you know, put some music on. And someone will say, uh, you know, what, what do you want to listen to? And they'll say, ah, oh, whatever. And you're like, okay, well, I've got Spotify open. You're going to have to narrow it down a little bit than whatever. And they go, oh, anything. And you're like, okay, there is like song after song after song, category after category. These are some of the categories that I found on Spotify last night. A perfect day. Your coffee break. Songs to sing in the shower, someone. All right, one person's used that before. Soundtrack to your morning. Feel Good Friday, Air Punch, Calm Vibes, Creativity Boost, Just Smile, uh, Last One Awake. I'd advise that person to go to sleep. There's morning acoustic, afternoon acoustic, even evening acoustic. There is a song for your day. There is a song for your mood, for your experience. Whatever you're about to do, there is probably a category, a playlist of music just for that. And you're like, man, how difficult is it to make a decision? The other day I was in a restaurant and I was like, oh, uh, can I order this? And they said, yeah, yeah, it comes with a side of fries, uh, of a side of chips. And I said, great. And the waiter said, okay, what kind of chips do you want? And I'm like, well, chips are chips. Just like, I grew up, yeah, just chips. And he was like, no, no, it's like almost like this drop-down box to chips now. There's like, oh, you want big fat chips? Do you want normal chips? Do you want skinny chips? Do you want sweet potato fries? And everyone said, oh, amen. Or, you know, do you want wedges? Do you want mash? Or if you're really posh, you can have dolphin wild potatoes. If you're from the south of Manchester, obviously. Come on, someone's like, yeah, dolphin while my jam. But there's all these different choices, and really we go through life, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to control the outcome, aren't we? We're trying to make sure that our yes, our decisions have the best outcome, the most positive outcome for our lives. And one of the biggest decisions I remember making, uh, I was 18 years old, I'd just finished college, I'd done... I uh, studied music, I was a drummer, and all I wanted to do is the rock and roll, kind of be in a band and write music and tour and live for Jesus as well, somewhere in the middle of that. And that's kind of what I was going to do. I was pretty much made the decision, and then it came before the summer of making uh, that choice. And I, ha and I had the opportunity to maybe then, instead of do that, come to Manchester, the greatest city in the world. Come on. All right, okay. Uh, and I kind of had this decision, I didn't really know what to do, and do I give up all this dream and what I wanted to do, do I come to Manchester? And in the end, I felt like it was a real God thing, and I made the decision to come to Manchester. I would leave the leafy suburbs and villages of Stratford-upon-Avon in the Midlands and come to Manchester, the urban ghetto, and I moved from there to Longsight in my first year in Manchester. It was incredible. Here is uh, my first house that I lived in with some of the people. That's me on the right-hand side. That is 18-year-old me. Way more hair on my head and way less on my face. Um, I hope you like the decor that we had. That was a mattress in the back corner, and we covered it with some wrapping paper. 
that we found. Um, glorious days. See, I had no idea that saying yes to come to Manchester would result in this. I had no idea what was on the other side of Manchester. And I've now lived here for 11 years, and uh, we've had some incredible highs, some you know, real heartbreaking lows, and it's been a real adventure. Uh, but I, had no, I, didn't, I couldn't really comprehend what was on the other side of my yes at 18 years old to where I'm stood now. And one of the big decisions and one of the things that I could never have guessed that was going to happen is that a few years into living in Manchester, I met a young lady, a blonde bombshell, a tornado. You could hear her before you saw her. She was incredibly loud. Oh, my word. She was nuts. She was absolutely crazy. And her name coming up on screen is Carly. That's my wife up there. That's not how we normally dress, okay? That was a party. I didn't say that in the first service. People are like, wow, what a weird couple. Um, that was a geek party at youth, but this is my wife. And I had no idea, 18 years old, saying yes to come to Manchester, that on the other side of that yes, that I would one day meet my wife. And uh, a few years later, of, of after being married, then this happened. Hey, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Heartwarming. Uh, Roman is up there. He's not two just yet. And uh, little Remy, Roman and Remy, little Remy was born literally like six weeks ago. And uh, we've got two boys. And again, I had no, I couldn't have comprehended. I had no idea that saying yes to come to Manchester would have meant all the great opportunities that I've had, the people that I've met, the apartments and houses that I've stayed in, the places that I've visited, the highs, the lows, meeting Carly, having two boys, and all the other stuff that have happened, doing the adult things like buying a house and getting a mortgage and buying a car and doing all sorts of different things. I could never have imagined that when I made that decision of yes at 18, that all of that was to come. And studying and, and kind of really do, diving into this festival, uh, to me, what it represents is a remembering of the past. This festival represents everything that God has done. And there's a moment to stop and remember the incredible goodness and grace of God that hit our lives. We take a moment during this festival and we take the moment today to remember the yes that we said to Jesus, the yes that we said to his freedom. And that's what this festival represents. And maybe some of you in the room have said yes. Maybe some of you in the room have not said yes yet and you're here today because you've been invited or you just thought it would be good or you've been coming a little while but you wouldn't call yourself a Christian and that's okay. Stick with us for a little bit. I'd love to unpack this and, and talk about what that yes means and give you an opportunity to make that decision yourself. See, the, the Unleavened Bread Festival to me is a moment to remember all that God has done and you've got to know that God has always done way more than you could ever imagine. But it also is a moment to be ready and expectant for all that he is about to do. All that he is about to do. And it's a determination and a readiness to keep saying yes, to follow. Yes, God, I want your freedom. But yes, God, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And this is what this festival is all about. And I want us to dive back into Exodus, really where the beginning of this festival started. And it really is a bit of a uh, connected to the Passover. Pastor Mark Foster preached on the Passover festival. Uh, and in the Bible, there's a Passover festival. And then the next seven days is kind of connected was the Unleavened Bread Festival. And so I want us to dive back into Egypt where the people of God, the Israelites, found themselves. Now, the, the Bible says that the Israelites had been in Egypt for 430 years. 430 years, they'd been forced into slavery, and now generation after generation, slavery was just normal. They were born into slavery. They were forced. They were abused. They were badly treated. They were born, like I said, into slavery. They would work their whole lives and just die as a slave. There was no real hope. There was no real expectation. There was no real life. They were just under the thumb of Pharaoh in Egypt. Imagine what that life would have been like just born into slavery, know that you're going to be badly treated for your whole life to build a nation that you weren't really from, and then go. And the Bible says that God heard the cry of his people. So we have a gracious God. We have a good God. He heard the cry of the people, and he raised up in Moses a leader, uh, a type of savior, and he sent him back into Egypt to lead his people out. And Moses went to Pharaoh and says, let God's people go that they may worship him. 
because that is our chief goal, to worship God, to be worshipers, to live in light of the freedom and everything that he's done and honor him. And there was this tussle and wrestle and the 10 plagues came and Pharaoh said no and he said no and he said no and then it came to the 10th plague and finally on an evening after 430 years of slavery, Pharaoh said, okay, get out of here. Could you imagine that moment? For the million people that represented God's people at that time, the Israelites, that can you, imagine, you know, can you imagine the whispers? You know, Pharaoh says we can go. Pharaoh says we can go. Could you imagine they're like, I don't know if to believe this. This is crazy because no amount of effort, no amount of uh, money could have got their own freedom. They were they were helpless. There's nothing that they could have done to win their own freedom. And then suddenly Pharaoh says go. And the Bible says that it was by the power of God that He set His people. Free. He took them from Egypt, slavery, into the promised land of freedom. And they had a moment where they said, okay, we're, we're having, well, what should we do? Should we stay in Egypt? Should we stay where I was born? Should we stay in the place that I knew that was normal, that is comfortable, and, and everything that I'd worked and lived for? Should we stay there? Or should we give this God a go? Should we trust God and step into the freedom that he is offering right now? And you may be st- sat here this morning and you don't know God and you're faced with that same decision. Shall I stay in what I know in the slavery of this life that I'm living right now? Or shall I trust God for a moment and accept and say yes to his freedom? Because I want to tell you that no matter what your life is like right now, without Jesus... Whatever you leave behind is nothing compared to where God is taking you. Come on. There is nothing like where God wants to take you. And so the Israelites made the decision to say yes to God's freedom. Yes. And God, by his power, brought them out of Egypt and took them into the wilderness on the way to the promised land. And the Bible says that they had to leave in such a hurry. We catch it here in Exodus 12. It says, for bread, they baked flat cakes from the dough. Ollie, why don't you come and help me? Uh, and they, uh, from the dough, without yeast. They had brought from Egypt. It was made without yeast because the people were driven out of Egypt in such a hurry that they had no time to prepare the bread or other food. And see what was happening, there was like a physical uh, thing that was happening where there was, God was displacing his people from slavery, from, from Egypt, into the promised land, into freedom. And in that moment, God chose this piece of bread to illustrate not just what he was wanting to do externally uh, and physically for his people, but what he was wanting to do within them. And he chose this bread as a symbol of what he wanted to do for his people. And see, reading and kind of discovering this, I'm going to give you my best, like, British Bake Off kind of knowledge here right now. But what they did in in making bread, they had a dough, and they would put what they called a leavening agent into the dough. And there's all sorts of different kind of leavening agents that you can get, but for the Israelites, what they used was yeast. So they had this dough, and they would put yeast in it. And the yeast, once it was in the dough, you couldn't get it back out again. There was no way of dis- uh, extracting it out again. Uh, and the yeast kind of took on this natural process of releasing all this different stuff and gases. And it was like this natural process of decay that made the dough rise and puff up. And what God said is, you see this dough? The see- you see this dough that you're used to making and the yeast? Well, this yeast is like your sin. This yeast is like your sin. Once it's in your life, you can't really get back out again. And and it's kind of in your life and it puffs up your life and it goes on a natural process of decay and the sin in your life that will just lead to death. And that was the state that God found his people in. That's the state that even today God finds a lot of the world in, in this decay, in this kind of slavery to sin, slavery to the power of sin in our lives, living void of God. And God says, no, no, I don't, I don't want you to live like that, but I want you to be unleavened. I want you to make this unleavened bread. I, don't want, I want you to make it without the yeast. And there's a picture that just came up that, that is the unleavened bread. And so what they would do, they would add everything that they added, but this time they wouldn't add the yeast that, that puffs it up. Uh, and it would look like this. And they say that they would stripe it and uh, they would pierce it through. And as it cooked, it would come up almost like bruises. 
And for many generations, uh, the Jewish people would celebrate this unleavened festival as when God rescued them from Egypt, from slavery, and brought them into the promised land of freedom. And they would listen to what a previous generation have lived through. But God loved, looked at his people and said, I don't want you to just listen to what they lived through. I want you to live through this. I want you personally to experience this. And God found humanity still in this place of sin, sin still in this place of, of living without God, still in this place that no matter how good they lived or what they could do, they were still in a place of the power of sin in their lives. And so Jesus, in his most incredible love, looked at humanity and said, I, don't, I hear the cry. I hear the cry of humanity. I don't want to just leave them where they are. So they raised up a leader. They raised up a savior in Jesus. And they sent him down to the earth. And he laid down his life. That he was the ultimate sacrifice. He lived a sinless life. He was the unleavened bread church that gave his life, that was striped by the whip, that was pierced with the crown of thorns, pierced by the nails, and gave his life on the cross. See, Jesus is the unleavened bread. All those many years ago, God had a plan. And he said, this, what this unleavened bread would represent would one day be my deliverance of my people, would one day be the freedom of my people. See, there was no way that we could have bought our own freedom. There was no way that we could have done enough to get to God for him to be pleased with us. There, there was no way we could have done it like the Israelites couldn't have got out of Egypt, like you can't get yeast out of a dough, we couldn't have done it ourselves, but only by the power of God, only by Jesus giving his life, that then the power of sin was broken in our lives. It's almost like the sin came out, and as they celebrate this festival, it's almost like when you eat the bread, it's the power of God, Jesus living in us, because Jesus died. Jesus died on the cross, and that was the Passover but he rose again in line with the Unleavened Bread Festival. So this festival represents the resurrection of our King, the resurrection of Jesus that to me and to you means that we get to stand in freedom, not that we could free ourselves, not that we could get out of the, of the brokenness and the slavery of ourselves, but in us, his power to set us free. Come on, this is the gospel right here. And as I've been reading it this last few weeks, I've been excited. I've been excited of the power of the gospel of what this festival represents. See, we couldn't have done it ourselves. Come on, where were you when God heard you, your cry? Where were you sat? What was happening in your life? Where were you when you said yes to Jesus? See, this is all about remembering the yes of accepting his freedom. And this festival and this sacrifice and what Jesus did demands a response from us, demands a moment where we stop and just go, thank you, Jesus, because I couldn't have done it. But yet for your grace, yet for your mercy, I'm now free. Ephesians puts it like this, but God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though that we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by grace that you have been saved. Church, we were dead. We were slaves to sin. But by Jesus, we're free. Come on, has anyone got any thanks this morning? Has anyone got any praise that they have a God that so loved you, that gave everything, that by his grace and mercy we could be free? Man, where were you? Come on, what pain did he cover? What sickness did he heal? What lie did he rip up? Where did he find you? What brokenness did he come to? What misfit kind of person did he approach and just say, no, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. I love you, I love you. I gave everything just so that you could know my freedom. We say yes to freedom. We say yes to freedom. But also this festival represents not just the remembering of all that God has done, but all that he is about to do and our readiness to keep saying yes. We say yes to following, but we want to say yes. We say yes to freedom, but we want to say yes to keep following Jesus. See, for the Israelites, the exodus out of Egypt was just the beginning. God just didn't want to free them and then just let them be there by themselves and was like, cool, see you in heaven, guys. No, no, no. He wanted them to follow him. 
And so the Bible says God led the million people, the Israelites, to the edge of the promise. And when God said go, the Israelites said no. And instead of stepping into the promise, instead of saying, yes, God, I want to follow you, things got a little bit tough. And they said no. So what happened? A whole generation spent the rest of their lives, 40 years, walking around in circles. Man, I don't want to be that generation. Come on, we don't want to be a church that says yes to freedom, but then says no to follow. I don't want to walk around in circles. I don't want to get to the edge of a promise. I don't want to get to the edge of a church that stops the traffic and just say, no, I think that's too difficult. I'll step back. Come on, are you still ready to say yes? Come on, because you may have said yes to freedom. But for some of us, when did we stop saying no to follow? And this is where we find ourselves. Because God's love is so unconditional. But our living for him can become conditional. Our God's love is reckless. It's unconditional. But we can find ourselves because life happens. We get to a place of saying, okay, but our following for you, God, can become conditional. If it's good for me, then yeah. If it works for me, then yeah. If it's easy enough, then yeah. I want us to jump back into Hebrews 12. And we read it before. And it says this, Therefore, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. See, in high school, primary school, one of my favorite days was sports day. Come on, I know a whole heap of you are like, man, that is the day that I bunked school. But I love sports day. I love to sprint. Thing is, the good thing about sprinting is that no matter how good or bad it was going or how good or bad you feel, you know that the finish line is pretty much there. Do you know what I mean? 100 meters. When you're in primary, that's like 40 meters, you know? And you're like, you're sprinting. You know it's going to finish soon. I hated the 800 meters. Horrible. But what I found about following Jesus, it's less of a sprint race and more of an endurance race. It's more of an endurance race. This is what the Bible is saying here. Run the race of endurance. Last year, in fact, where's my friend Jayon? Jump up, Jayon. Here he is. Jayon recently rode a bike from London to Brighton to raise money. That's pretty good, isn't it? Although us northerners have no idea how far that is. Like, everything below Birmingham, just, yeah. Last year, me and, and uh, three friends, uh, we set out and we said yes to, let's do the most craziest enduro race that we could do. And we came across a race called Tough Mudder. Tough Mudder, this thing right here. It was crazy. There's a picture coming up. Like, it was insane. We had no idea really what we were letting ourselves in for. It was 20 kilometers of like grueling uphill, downhill, through streams. There's obstacles every, every few kilometers. We were kind of swimming through ice cube uh, pools. We were getting electrocuted. Uh, we were up and down mud mountains, wading through mud up to my knee. It was absolutely crazy, and I, every obstacle. But what I learned about an endurance race is that you basically just have to keep going. Just keep going. Every obstacle you face, just say, yeah. Uh, we're going to have this one. Because the key to finishing the race is to just keep saying yes. See, what you don't want to do in an endurance race is pick up weight. Like, you want to stay free so that you can keep following. You want to stay free so you can keep running. The worst thing that I could have done on that day is just like put on a big backpack and just like, yeah, I'll carry this and I'll carry that and I'll put all this stuff on. Like that would have been the worst thing because what can happen is an endurance race, the, the heavy and the more weight that you've got, that yes can quickly turn to no because of the weight that's dragging you down. Man, that's exactly like following Jesus, I've found. Whether you've been a Christian five minutes or 50 years, we go through stuff, we hit obstacles, our experiences take us 
through things and we start to pick up the weight and carry things that we were never meant to carry that we get from these experiences and obstacles. And instead of running free, running free to follow God, we have all this weight, like the Bible says in Hebrews, no, 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 don't, don't carry the weight, get it off, because there is a race to run, and it's an endurance race. But we can go through life. And like the Bible says, there is sin that can really easily entangle us. And we can make bad decisions and bad choices and get into habits and we can find ourselves kind of wrapped up in stuff that almost makes us feel like we're disqualified from the call of God. That you walk into church and just feel not good enough. That we talk about purpose and doing something great for God and you're like, are you joking? Do you know who I am? Do you know what's happening? And, and sin, what happens is in this endurance race of following Jesus, we, we add it to our backpack and becomes a little bit more heavier and a little bit more difficult to say yes. Maybe it's fear. Maybe we pick up fear because of something that's happened in the past and we fear rejection. We fear uh, not having enough money. We feel, oh, I don't know if I can be on team. I don't know if I can do this on church on tour. I don't know if I can commit to that as well. And uh, I don't know if I can invite someone because of what, what, they, what they might say and fear it all going wrong. Living with anxiety, hey, it's, a, it's a weight that we carry that makes it a lot easier to say no. When God speaks, maybe it's disappointment. I really felt that maybe there's people here that you'd said, oh, years ago, I used to be a leader in church. I used to do this. I used to do that. I used to do great things. I used to believe for great things. But because of something that's happened, maybe a, a prayer that you prayed that didn't happen, disappointment diminishes our faith. And when we come to expect again, where our expectation and faith levels are lowered because of previously is what's happened. And we carry disappointment like a weight on our back struggling to believe again, struggling to go again. Maybe it's offense. Maybe someone's done something to you that you just you're so wrapped up in what they've done to you, you can't really move forward. Maybe uh, it could be a whole heap of things. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe the lens that you live by is just comfort. It's just, okay, if this is good for me, then I'll do it. If this works out for me, then, then I'll do it. If this, is, if this is inconvenient though, then no. Maybe it's insecurity like it was for me. Just bothered about what everyone else is thinking all the time that throws me out from saying yes to following. But I love when you read it in Exodus. Uh, the Bible says that, 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 that they were kind of, God was saying go and they had to go quickly. They were ready. They weren't trying to get all their stuff together. They weren't carrying any weight. The Bible says they didn't have time to do all of that. They were just ready. When God said go, they would go. And I've got this kind of feeling that as a church, we want to be a people that carry a heart that say, I haven't got time for this stuff. I haven't got time for this stuff. There is a race for me to run. I haven't got time for this sin. I haven't got time for this stuff. But I know that in and by his grace that I am more than able to come across it. This fear, I don't have time for this fear because there is a race to run. I don't want to get, take and live with this fear anymore. I'm going to live by faith and not by sight. I'm going to live by what can do in me. I don't want to live by this comfort because my God, he gave all, it all. He was all in. He gave everything. So not I that lived, but Jesus in me. Can we come to a place today? Like the writer in Hebrews says, you've got to take off every weight. We've got to take off every weight. You were never destined, you were never de designed to carry this weight. Because in this endurance race of following Jesus, man, it can be so easy to just say, nah. Because of the weight that we're carrying. But I believe again, today is a day of freedom. Come on, church, today is a day of freedom. I haven't got time to deal with this stuff. I haven't got time for my insecurity. I haven't got time for comfort. I haven't got time for sin. I haven't got time for fear. I haven't got time for disappointment because there is a race to run. Come on, somebody. There is a race to run. God has got a race for every single one of you. May we be a church who endures. May we be a church who says, even though it may be painful, yes, God. Even though it may hurt, yes, God. Even though it, why is it? I'm giving again, yes, God. Even though I lay my reputation on the line, yes, God. Even though everyone feels like they're against me, yes, God. Yes. Yes. Yes, Jesus. Because there is a race to run. 
and you have no idea what is on the other side of your yes. You have no idea of the impact of your yes. Because let me tell you, when you say yes, you come in line with the purposes of God and you come in line with the power of God to do something great. When you say yes to Jesus, an incredible adventure ahead. But what we have to do is not get caught up in the weight and carrying all this stuff. This is an endurance race. May we not be a church who just limp through. That when stuff comes, we're like, oh, no, I'm bowing out. But we stay focused and understand, man, there are people on the other side of my yes. Do you know on the other side of Moses' yes was the freedom for a whole nation? Lay down my insecurity, lay down my fear, lay down my lack of qualification, lay down of my gift. I, I Moses didn't have anything, but oh God, I'm just saying yes, use me. I want to be in line with your power and your purpose to do something great. And on the other side of his yes was the freedom of a nation. So you're 18 years old. The yes that I made, I had no idea what was on the other side of it. And like I said before, there's been some incredible highs, but there's been some really heartbreaking lows. And there's been many times where I felt like giving up. There's been many times where I've opened my eyes in the morning and just went, oh, I don't know if I can go again. I'm carrying this stuff. I'm carrying this hurt. I'm carrying this insecurity. I'm carrying this disappointment of what I thought was going to happen, but it's very far from the truth and reality that I'm living right now. And my endurance was being tested. But like the writer of Hebrews saying, we come back to the understanding of what God did in me and in my life. And there's a race to run. And I have no idea of the impact of my yes. I have no idea of, of what's on the other side of my yes. And the last uh, 10, 11 years, what I've loved is on the other side of my yes. And many other people's yeses here in this room that we've been a church that has seen 10,000 decisions in the first 10 years of church. That's why. Why is that? Because a whole group of people said, yes, God. Yes, whatever, whoever, whenever, why ever, I'm in. But sometimes it's been easy. Sometimes it's been hard. A few years ago, October 2016, we put on and attempted the biggest tour that we've ever done. We had uh, Reggie Dabbs from America, an inspirational speaker, and we were in like 15, 16 different schools, sessions every day, Monday to Friday. Uh, but the only problem was Saturday that week uh, was the due date of my first boy, Roman. A little bit nervous, like, okay, just hold it in, Carly. Let's do this. And it got to Thursday afternoon, we were sat in uh, Nando's and uh, I got a call saying this baby is coming and I was like ah okay drop Reggie off went and uh, our Roman was born at two minutes past three on Friday morning and we we're excited and we got home and uh, let me tell you the event was coming that night and we knew that there was going to be hundreds and hundreds of people who didn't know Jesus in this room and we had a moment to decide like with a valid context, do I say, no, I'm, I'm just going to do this and this is the right thing to do for me. But we made a decision as a family, but for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And so it was a pretty easy yes. And on that night, we got here in an incredible team and Reggie, we, we pulled off an incredible event. God moved and 203 people responded to Jesus in that night. And the impact of our church it's because of you and me continuing to say yes. Come on, church, can we be a people who endure, who keep saying yes, who keep saying yes? The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Do you know what was on the other side of Jesus' is yes? It was you. You are on the other side of Jesus' is yes. When he stood in the garden and said, oh God, I don't know if I can do this, could this cup pass from me? The joy in that moment and his ability to say, but not my will be done, yours be done, yes to the cross. His ability to do that is because he had you in mind. You were the joy. And what I believe God wants to do right now is this is a moment of freedom, but it's also I'm letting some stuff go. But it's also a moment of God breathing strength to tired, weary followers to say, no, keep going, keep enduring. Say, keep saying yes. Keep going because you have no idea who is on the other side of your yes.